Hello, everyone. Today, I have a very special guest. Um, I have Dr. Clemena Antonova, and I just want to um, read a little bit of, of her bio here. Um, Clemena read art history at the universities of Edinburgh and Oxford, and she works on topics relating to the art of the icon, um, Russian critiques of the image with, with, uh, with a focus on Pavel Florinsky, and the role of religion in modernity. And she's published many books and journal articles. And I'm very excited to say she contributed a great chapter to this book that I helped co-edit, um, Eastern Christian Approaches to Philosophy. And I'm just thrilled that she's agreed to meet with me today. So hello, Clemena. Wow, hello. Hi, hi, Joshua. It's a great pleasure to, um, to see you today and to have a talk with you today. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome, and the pleasure is all mine. Um, well, I just want to go ahead and dive in uh, to talking about this really fantastic chapter that you wrote um, for the book that I helped co-edit. Um, the title of this chapter, uh, I want to get it right here, is Christian Philosophy as a Philosophy of Crisis, Rereading Florensky in the 21st Century. Um, I got excited when you sent me that title. I thought that was really interesting. So... Um, in your chapter, you state that there is a very noticeable tendency of describing our contemporary experience in the language of crisis. Could you please unpack this statement for us and explain what you mean by the language of crisis? Okay, well, you know, um, let me start from two things here. First of all, uh, what I found interesting about the book and what I wanted to do with my chapter was to pay attention to language. Now, as the way you introduced me, you know, you get an impression, you, you can see that I've mainly been working on visuality, visual images, icons, icon theory, and so on. And I had done quite a lot of work on Florensky. So at the stage when you contacted me, I thought of just, you know, that I won't be working on him anymore. And then what caught my attention was the way you formulated the concept of the book, which I thought allowed me to do something which is uh, new for me. So to look at Florensky in a way I hadn't looked at him before with an attention on language rather than uh, visuality and visual themes and so on. So in this chapter, uh, my main concern and interest is language. And I basically start from um, something which I think is noticeable to, to everyone. So it's there's no great philosophy there. It's just a simple observation. Uh, we keep hearing, and we've been hearing for the last probably 20 years, uh, the way in which developments, usually obviously negative developments in our world, uh, are being described as crisis, you know, the financial crisis the refugee crisis, the environmental crisis, which might be the worst of them all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I was thinking about two things. First of all, that there are different ways of describing these situations. So it is a matter of choice, the kind of language that we choose to use to describe. You know, if you think about it, the refugee crisis is obviously also a tragedy. Uh, in different moments of modern history, people would have actually described all these phenomena in terms of the question or the problem. Think about it, the 19th century, when Marx wrote an essay on the Jewish question and people were talking about the Jewish question. Or later on in the 19th century, the woman problem. So I just think that language is important and revealing when we pay attention to it and we see it as a matter of choice. Why do people choose to describe a certain situation in such a way? So this is one thing. And the other thing which I think is something which would make an impression on anyone with my academic background. So people who are scholars who work on the intellectual history of the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, you immediately notice that the sort of language you hear, uh, this sort of language of crisis, sounds 
very, very familiar to you because you encounter it in your work, uh, in texts, uh, and basically in the intellectual development at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. So I think that this is something which is very striking. And, you know, I was interested in why this is the case. So is this just a matter of accident, a, a fashion and people start using a certain language? Or is it something that our period at the beginning of the 21st century actually shares in common with almost exactly 100 years ago, the beginning of the 20th century? And whether it is this sort of concerns, questions that we share that predetermine the choice of using this language of Christ. So this is why I started. I think that is incredibly fascinating. Um, and it's definitely relevant for today because you're absolutely right. I mean, everything you see, especially in the news and related to politics, is steeped in this language of crisis. There's always a catastrophe on the horizon or some huge problem, um, and everyone um, promotes it, whatever ideology they're trying to promote is usually um, within the context of trying to overcome some terrible crisis that's about to happen. So, um, yeah, this is definitely really important and relevant to, I think, everyone's yeah. life. Um, well, so... Uh, I guess it's important to think about um, Father Pavel Florensky for a second, because this is the the, the figure that you focus on in your chapter. Um, and a lot of people uh, may not be familiar with Pavel Florensky. Um, I know there's been, you know, some increased interest in him. And I think recently uh, you, you attended a conference in Cambridge that focused on Florensky's work. So there is a little bit of interest picking up, uh, but I think, most people will look at you funny and go, who's Pavel Florinsky? So do you mind giving <laughs> <I don't. laughs> yeah, a brief? Know, it is, uh, yeah, it has happened to me. And it, what you say is quite right, that uh, probably, let's say, around 20 years ago, he was quite unknown in among Western scholars. And now people are still sort of starting to hear about him in, in, in different contexts. Uh, it is still quite a small field of Florensky scholars. And, you know, the conference we had in Cambridge, which was organized by Christoph Schneider, he's uh, also a Florensky specialist, basically gathered together most of the Florensky specialists around the world. And it wasn't a huge conference, but, you know, <laughs> we all knew each other. For example, one of the people who was there was Avril, um, uh, Avril Pyman, who wrote the only so far biography of Florensky in English, which is a very well documented, very oh. well balanced biography of, uh, you know, a very interesting, fascinating figure. But in short, I think that what is really interesting about him is that in many ways, I think you can see him as a typical representative of a movement within Russian religious philosophy. So a lot of his philosophy plays on themes that you're going to encounter with other people within this movement. Uh, so this would be, you know, the sort of um, uh, a movement within philosophy, which is sometimes referred to as Sedinstva, which basically means all unity or full unity or something like that. And it goes back to the middle of the 19th century with the Slavophile philosophers Komyakov and Kiryevsky, the main figure within the movement is Vladimir Solovyov. So this is basically the thinker that in many ways formulated the main topics that later philosophers like Florensky would address and engage with. So in some ways, he's quite typical of this movement. He's also quite typical of a whole generation in Russia where basically people weren't that specialized the way they were at the time already in the West and the way scholars are nowadays. So basically you have someone, I, I think though that even within this context, he was quite an extreme example of someone who had expertise in so many different fields. 
you know, mm. he started by studying, which was again typical of many um academics in Russia that you would get your first degree in the faculty of physics and mathematics. So having a mathematical background was seen a bit like, you know, like in the West having a classics background. And mm. then from there, you know, he uh, moved to theology. So he wrote one of the most important theological treatises. Then when the Bolsheviks came to power, you know, it's interesting that a lot of the people he was working with were exiled as religious thinkers. Mm. Florensky stayed and he was allowed to stay because for the Bolsheviks, he was someone who was working on applied science because he had done quite a lot in, you know, exactly applied science. And at the time in the Bolshevik encyclopedia, he was there as a scientist. So you basically have someone who was working in completely different fields of knowledge and I mm. think that this is what has made him so uh, fascinating for some scholars nowadays. I think that this also makes him very difficult to understand because I think when you think mm. of him in this way, you miss a lot about his project because I think he had an overall project which cut across all these fields. So in mm. a way, it was incidental that he became... He was writing poetry or doing uh, something that we would describe as art history because all these things fit into the, his project. So, um, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, when we talk about interdisciplinary studies nowadays, you know, in a way, he's a very good example of a figure doing interdisciplinary studies. At the same time, I think that he would have been very surprised to have been described in such a way. Because I think that, you know, he had this sort of religious philosophical project, which, uh, uh, in which everything he dealt with, he brought to this main idea. You know? Yes. So. No, he is so incredibly fascinating to read. I mean, I'm not a, a I, I wouldn't consider myself a Florinsky scholar by any means, but um, I remember, oh, I guess this is about seven, eight years ago, um, I purchased his uh, book, a pillar, the, the Pillar and Ground of the Truth. And I was just floored by what I, what I was reading um, because of what you just described. Uh, this is a man who could easily transition from something like it felt like a, a kind of poetry to uh philosophy and he's dealing with uh what you might describe as continental philosophy but also um like logical positivism and analytic tradition and then he'll transition from that to um linguistics you know and he'll go from that to anatomy and it's just a you kind of it's difficult to follow um i mean you can see um just the wide range of his the knowledge he yeah. had and, yeah, it's... but you know, I think that uh, what is also interesting about that is because anyone who starts reading Florensky gets this sort of sense of awe at someone who is, you know, such a hugely knowledgeable person, someone who would be a genius. You know, he's very often described in uh, Russian intellectual history as the Russian Leonardo, someone who had expertise in all of these different fields. Mm -hmm. But I think that one of the negative aspects about that is that when people and scholars start with this sense of old, they find it a bit difficult to actually uh, understand or realize all the many mistakes or misinterpretations that you come across in Florensky. And I think that mm -hmm. some of them are actually intentional. So he says something which is absolutely not true not because he doesn't know, you know, the field mm. well enough, but because in a way, this field is so subservient to his overall project that in a way, this small truth doesn't matter so much. He's sort of manipulating it in a way to prop up his main project. And mm. in short, you know, because I've been mainly dealing with his, um, uh, you know, texts on visuality. And, you know, I think it's very interesting that after some time you realize that almost everything he says in the field of art history is wrong. 
but it is wrong in such an interesting way that mm. it opens doors towards very interesting ideas. But also, while it is wrong, art historically, it is something very deep and original and valuable in terms of philosophy and in terms of his overall philosophical approach. So That's you see what I mean? Incredibly fascinating. Um, that explains a lot because I, I too have found him very difficult to interpret at times and to follow the argument. Um, and I come from, you know, my training is mainly in contemporary analytic philosophy. So, um, you know, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to follow his thinking and to figure out what is he trying to say? What's the argument here? Uh, but I kind of enjoy it. So I keep coming back and rereading it. You know, over the years, I've returned to that book many times just for the pleasure of trying to figure out what's going on. And 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 um, so yeah. I, I wanted to, to highlight that that biography you mentioned is really good. I've read that. I think it's called um, A Quiet Genius. Is that the title? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your- yeah. Yeah. It's a very yeah. good book. It's I actually a, found yeah. myself tearing up towards the end um, because it's very tragic, you know, what happens to him uh, at the end of his yeah. life. It's also something that happened to many people within uh, this uh, milieu. Uh, mm. But uh, I think that, you know, in some ways, because, you know, he, uh, so many of his friends and associates and colleagues were forced to leave. And when they were forced to leave, most of them left in 1922 on what is called in Russian history, the philosophership. You know, it was seen as they were the one that was suffering an evil fate. Well, you know, he was the lucky one who had been allowed to stay. And Mm. then with hindsight, you realize that in a way they were the lucky ones because, you know, these became the emigre philosophers that under difficult circumstances, but like they could continue working. And Florensky ended up being executed in uh, this very big uh, Stalinist purge in 1937. Mm. His family wasn't even told, like it happened with many other people, that it took years Mm. for their families to realize that, you know, they had been uh, executed. So, um, yeah. Well, uh, thank you for that. I, I think we could probably sit here and talk for a long time just about his life and um but i want to dive into to thinking more about some of the ideas especially the ones you cover in the book so one of the things that's interesting in your chapter uh, is you argue that florinsky was more of a religious philosopher than a th- theologian so a lot of people maybe think of him more of a theologian but you say he's he's a religious philosopher and that he's engaged in the task of translating theological concepts into the language of philosophy so could you maybe talk about that a little bit and talk about this task and why Florensky thought it was important to do this? Yes. Um, well, you see, this for me is quite uh, an important idea because I think that there's quite a lot of misunderstanding, not just about Florensky, but about the whole of this tradition in Russian philosophy. Uh, because these people, Solovyov, Florensky, Sergei Bulgakov, uh, Nikolai Berdyaev, and so on. Because a lot of the language they use sounds like theological language. Uh, And because they talk so much about religion and how the crisis of modernity has to do with the idea that modern man has lost touch with higher being, God, and the religious dimension in uh, human experience. So a lot of this talk uh, lends itself to being seen as, you know, part of a very conservative religious project that seems to suggest that the way out of, you know, the problems we're facing these days is to go back to a pre-modern religious Christian view. And I think that with Florensky and with some of these people, you do have ideas that play on, on, on this notion. But I think that these are not the interesting ideas. I think that projects that are backward looking, uh, pre-modern, first of all, I don't have a lot of sympathy with them on a 
purely subjective level, <laughs> but I don't even think that intellectually they're very interesting. I think, however, that there is that the heart of this Russian religious philosophical tradition has something very, very valuable, which goes in a completely different direction. And the completely different direction is that, yes, all these people say we have lost this transcendent religious dimension of life and we should recover it. But it is all the time about recovering it within our modern context in a view of addressing our problems, not the problems of the 14th century, our problems. And I think that Florensky is quite um, a good illustration of this. Because I think if you look at all the major ideas in his writings, almost all of them, they always start, his thinking on a certain problem starts from a very concrete problem that he faced, that his generation faced at his time. So he starts from this very concrete issue. And then he develops a philosophical um, uh, position to face this issue. But he's actually facing a concrete modern problem. And this is why, you know, I just found it useful to uh, borrow the expression that Rowan Williams uses in this excellent book I saw that he wrote on uh, Dostoevsky some years ago. And he talks there about Dostoevsky as developing a project of religious modernity. Hmm. And I think that this is the, this concept is very applicable and valid in the case of Florensky as well. That you have to go beyond language that seems to point to a religious conservative project and to look at these ideas that are very modern and very interesting. And I think that, you know, as with the book you read, The Pill and the Ground of Truth, you see references to mathematical uh, ideas. Lewis Carroll, you know, the author of Alice in Wonderland, was a professor in mathematics at Oxford. And so uh, Florensky borrows some of his mathematical ideas and so on. And I think that what he tells us with that is that his concern with religion, with uh, recovering a connection between man and God is not something that is separate from modernity, but is very much part and parcel of modernity. And it's about incorporating the religious dimension along with uh, modern problems that we face today. So this mm. is what I find interesting about these people. You know, when they start talking, which they do, uh, you know, about these sort of conservative religious ideas uh, that were very much part of the discourse of the Russian Orthodox Church at the time and now. This is not something which is going in a very promising direction, but there's so much interesting, valuable, original ideas there at the same time. Yes, and that's what I find enjoyable about his writing and the other figures that you've mentioned, because... They're bold and they're they're creative, and um, so I also I'm I'm not interested in just okay. Let's go back to the fourth century and just they have all the answers to everything. Let's think about you know. Um, mm, I yeah. would rather I would rather find inspiration from say someone from the fourth century, but then go further and like you said, try to look at the problems that we face, um, and. I guess that was also part of my interest in the the book was that we would, you know, it wasn't intended to just be a historical survey of different thinkers, but trying to actually bring creatively um, Eastern Christian kind of thinkers and ideas yeah. into conversation with philosophy, contemporary philosophy. So I, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, yeah. Ironically, it's funny I, when people especially, you know, idolize, say, figures from like the third or fourth century, especially like the Cappadocian fathers or people love them or St. Maximus, the confessor. What they often seem to forget is those individuals, they were all original creative thinkers themselves. They 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 helped themselves to the, all of the thinkers and, and ideas of their day, you know, Neoplatonists and Stoic philosophers, and they creatively synthesized ideas. So people seem to forget that 
and that, I feel like that's an example set for us that we should we should do that as well, not just kind of slavishly yeah. repeat. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, and I think that uh, uh, this also applies not just for you know Florensky's generation. I think it in a way applies very much to you know all scholars that come later, like including us. And I think that in a way Florensky is um, I think interesting for many people partly because so many of his writings were left in an, a fragmentary form and were not finished. I think, you know, it is very normal to imagine that when someone didn't live a very long life, as he was murdered, you know, in his 50s, I think, uh, basically, and was working on so many different things, you can understand that there wasn't even the time, and I also think it wasn't part of his mental makeup to actually completely finish a project. You see that the project has so many interesting ideas, but they're very often not fully developed, which basically means that for a scholar to engage with Florence, it gives you so much scope for a little bit of creativity on your part, because so many of the ideas are obviously left unfinished. And you have to, first of all, try to Imagine how he would have developed them. And then you try to imagine how these ideas at the beginning of the 20th century would actually apply uh, to our present day context. Because, you know, when I say that there's so many analogies between the beginning of the 21st century and 100 years ago, I think that there's also quite a lot of things which are new in our time. And I think that it's not that the answers to all of them were going to come from thinkers a hundred years ago. But I think also that if we disregard this intellectual tradition, we're going to miss quite a lot, which would be obviously useful to us now. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, so let's, okay, we, we started off our conversation talking about the crisis of modernity. And um, we kind of hinted that you're going to, you know, uh, bring the the ideas of uh, Pavel Florinsky into conversation with this uh, language of crisis, and so and we've talked about you, how Florinsky is translating these different um, theological ideas into um, philosophical terminology and language. And there's one concept that that seems to be very important for Florinsky that you highlight in the chapter, and that's the concept of consubstantiality, um, which is a really important anyone who studies uh, theology, you know, would, would likely be familiar with that concept in that context. So why is that concept of consubstantiality uh, important for Florinsky? What role does it play in his, his thinking? Yes, uh, I think this is actually a great question because I think, of course, everyone who studies theology, and I would hope that anyone who identifies as a religious thinker, uh, would have an idea about co-substantiality in its theological meaning. Basically, uh, it's a term that uh, came about in the fourth century in order to describe the relationship among the three persons of the Trinity. And, you know, in the first uh, council, the first ecumenical council at Ikea, basically they came up with this formulation and it comes down to the idea that God the Father uh, God the Son and the Holy Spirit share the same substance. Therefore, they're consubstantial. And throughout the Middle Ages and uh, throughout uh, Christian theology, this is how this theological concept is being used. And in this sense, I think it is quite original uh, um, to think of taking this concept in exactly this sort of theological meaning and apply it to quite a different uh, set of relationships. Uh, so basically what Florensky does is that he takes the concept of consubstantiality and he applies it to describing the relationships and the bonds that exist among people. Now, he talks specifically about love between two people. So that sort of relationship. But I think that the way he talks about it and the very fact that he 
moves from the application of a theological concept that describes the Trinity to applying it to relationships between people allows you to see it as a way of describing general uh, bonds among people in the world, humanity. And what I think is interesting about that is, again, it's a concept that I think um, Florensky leaves in a very fragmentary form because he uses it to describe the relationship between two people in love, you know. But I think that there's this potential of actually developing the concept uh, along the lines of this sort of idea that you have in much of secular philosophy, religious philosophy, and so on, of the notion of a common humanity. What makes brings people together? What are the bonds that exist among people? And I think that in secular philosophy, you have a, an understanding of common humanity, which is, you know, um, I think I would describe it as a weak form of common humanity, where all human beings, therefore, we are alike, no matter, you know, our skin color and where we live and things like that. Now, I think that this is a weak form compared to the sort of concept you can extract from Florence, because it's a completely different, there's so much more powerful uh, claim to say that what all human beings share is not just that we are all the same in terms of our humanity, but we all share humanity with Christ. And because we share humanity with Christ, when you face another person, you are facing not just another human being, you are facing Christ, God the Son, in this human being. Therefore, your sense of responsibility, your care, your love, is of quite a different kind. And I think that, you know, um, it is in this sense, I, I believe, that, you know, there were some uh, theologians, I remember when I was in Germany in 2015, at the height of the refugee crisis, and, you know, they were writing that when you let and allow people to drown in the Mediterranean and you don't do anything about it, you're not letting other human beings with whom you share humanity to die. You are letting Christ himself die. So I think mm. that this is the sort mm. of idea that Florensky was driving at. Now, I don't think he was interested as such in the notion of a common humanity. I am. But I think that his idea of love between two people can be developed in such a way. That it's it's beautiful the way you described it and um, you know I I want to think about that concept and how that might tie into thinking about um, you know the crisis of modernity these various crises that we are surrounded with. Um, well, you know, if I may say something, which I think is in a way sort of brings us back to the beginning of our conversation. You know, what I find interesting about the notion of crisis is that when you use this language rather than problem, question, tragedy, or whatever other word can come to mind, in each of these cases, you are making a certain implication. So you choose to use the term crisis because you are making an implication which is not there with tragedy and not all the rest of the terms you might choose. And I think that if you go back to the original meaning of crisis, the original meaning in ancient Greek, a crisis means decision. It basically means mm. a point in your life or a point in history in which things come to a head in such a way that you are forced by circumstances to make a decision. So crisis is not just a tragedy or apocalypse or something like that. It is the moment at which you are facing the alternatives you have and you have to make a decision. And I think that when you, this is in a way for me the common thread between the beginning of the 20th century and now, that when you, we talk about all these sort of crises, the environmental crisis, it's not just to say that something bad is happening, because that's sort of you observe. Obviously, we can see that the climate is changing and this is very bad. You know, what 
you are saying by using the word crisis is that you imply that the situation is such that you have to make a decision. And I think that this is how uh, Florensky's generation was using the term as well. And I think in a way, the most extreme example, the clearest example, is probably actually Lenin, a contemporary of Florence. You know, when he was writing in the months preceding the October Revolution, he was sending these sort of uh, repeatedly uh, telegrams to the Politburo saying the crisis is right. He didn't mean that there was a tragedy. He thought it's a great thing because we are forced by the circumstances that are developing around to make a decision and we shouldn't miss the moment of making a decision. So I think that this sort mm. of uh, thinking about crisis as something that forces you to uh, make a choice between alternatives is very much there. And I think it's also um, very much part of our discourse. And that's why I think that this tradition is once again, very, very relevant. Absolutely. I, I actually really like that um, because you're right, the connotation that um, that most people get from the word crisis is that it's terrible, it's horrible. But yeah. thinking about it in terms of a, a very pivotal decision, um, I mean, it, 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 uh, that, that has weighty consequences, um, that kind of changes it. But you know, this uh, has to do with what you just uh, said, you know, translating, you know, uh, uh, theology into philosophy. I think that uh, it is interesting to see. This is actually, in a way, my new project, something I've been thinking a lot about. You know, the the way that we use religious language in modern. Because I think that there's certain experiences that you cannot describe except by resorting to religious language. You may use it in a very secular sense, but the words are there, mm -hmm. and there was, there's always a grain of the original uh, religious meaning that remains. And I think that this is why it's always useful to go to these pre-modern origins, genealogies of modern terms, because they can be very revealing about the ways in which we also use terms nowadays. Crisis, yes. You know, uh, what comes to your mind is, oh, something very, very bad is happening. But if you look at the history of the concept and its original meaning, you see that there's something much more than just making an observation that we are surrounded by very bad things. Also, if you go back, and I think that there's some analogy between crisis and apocalypse. Nowadays, when you say apocalypse, there's a modern meaning of the end of the world, you know, there'll be an apocalypse, a nuclear catastrophe, and the world won't exist anymore. But if you think of the pre-modern meaning, it's analogous to crisis, that apocalypse means both fear of the end of time, but also hope at what's going to happen, the hope and the promise that the second coming of Christ, for example, in the Christian context holds. Mm -hmm. So these pre-modern meaning and connotations, I think are very useful to go back to because they can be very relevant for the ways in which terms are being used nowadays. And we often don't realize that. Yes, um, I love that. And I'm just sat here thinking about everything we've discussed and just thinking about the the, the beauty of that picture of consubstantiality and the idea that um, <clears throat> when we're faced with these difficult choices that we're faced with, we have a choice um, to either ignore the, the common humanity that we share um, with others or to make that the, the, the most primary thing that, 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 that determines our decision maker to, um, to recognize that common humanity. Um, yeah. So there are some other interesting ideas that you kind of hint at in the chapter about how Florensky's ideas could contribute to the contemporary um, discussions. Um, you talk about theories of multiple modernity um, and secularization, and then also communitarian philosophy. Um, and you kind of hint that there's ways that maybe Florensky's ideas, this project he has of translating religious concepts into philosoph philosophical ones, um, maybe could contribute to these kind of discussions. Could you maybe talk about that a little bit? 
Yes, uh, I, I don't want to bore you because this is a really very large topic. So I'll just yeah, try right. to <laughs> synthesize what I think is common among all these free movements uh, within philosophy these days. And I think that in a way, what is common among them from my perspective is that uh, these are all very important uh, moments of contemporary philosophy that completely disregards uh, Russian religious thought. You know, for example, uh, secularization theories, uh, all these discussions uh, around what constitutes uh, secularization. I think probably the most promising way of thinking about that is uh, the philosophy of uh, Michel Foucault and nowadays Charles Taylor. And basically, the main idea there is that uh, a secularization arises out of developments within um, late Latin Christianity. Secular terms come out of ideas that we see within Latin Christianity in the late medieval period. This is the main, uh, the main thesis of Charles Taylor in his book, A Secular Age, where he tells us the story of the rise of secularism out of the spirit of reform in the late medieval period. Now, the story he tells, which is a very compelling story, is almost completely a Western story. So he looks at developments within Latin Christianity, Protestantism, that lead to modern secularization. Uh, then if you look at the series of multiple modernities, you know, in a way they address this issue because the whole notion of multiple modernities goes to the idea that we tend to think of modernity in the singular as Western modernity. Mm. Uh, while at the same time, in a globalized world, you notice more and more that it's not about the West being modern and everybody else being backward and uh, having to catch up with the West. But there's another way of describing the modern world that actually modernity, the different models of modernity and Western modernity is one of many. So the Russian model that is again, completely disregarded in this uh, discussion is one of the models of modernity. And that connects to the secularization series of Foucault and Charles Taylor, because one of the uh, big ideas of um, Charles Taylor is that the opposition between religions, religious and secularism, uh, the disconnect between religion and secularism is something which is unique to the Western world. It doesn't exist in non-Western societies. And in other words, if you think about uh, uh, the Russian model of modernity as developed by people like Florensky and others, it is one type of model of modernity rather than thinking about it as backward way of thinking which hasn't quite caught up with Western modernity and all that. And it just shows one of the different ways of getting to modernity and one of the different ways of engaging with secularity because the connection, in short, and I'll finish with that, the connection between religion and secularism, as Charles Taylor has shown, in every other tradition apart from the Western one, is much more fixed, much, much more fused, much more mixed, rather than a simple opposition that exists in the Western model that was constructed by Enlightenment thinkers. And in this sense, the, the Russian model is interesting because it shows the way that religious and secular ideas interpenetrate. And Florence is um, a good illustration of that because, as we discussed, there are all these religious theological ideas that are sort of naturally merged with ideas from science, from physics, from mathematics and so on. So the model of modernity is a very complex one and a very in a completely different one from the opposition between secular and religious reason.
Mm. Uh, oh, just to address what you said about uh, communitarian philosophy, just very quickly, that communitarian philosophy looks at the relationship between the community and the individual, and again shows that these don't exist in opposition. An individual is formed within a community. You know, a community is made up of individuals, and it's basically a philosophy which I think on one level is a reaction against excessive forms of individuals. So in this sense, I think that this whole movement of philosophy, you know, would actually, it, it would be very natural for people within this tradition to engage with uh, Russian religious philosophers like Florensky because they ask very much the same questions. And they're also concerned very much with the critique of excessive individualism and with the ways in which individuals exist in community, rather than in opposition to communities. Yes, all of what you said. I, you know, I feel like we could dedicate an, another hour to talk, <laughs> to discussing and unpacking. It's not raw people. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, no, I think I think that's so. Um, just to, to, to highlight one of the things you said. Um, the kind of finding inspiration in Florensky and how this project he has of trying to um, first to translate this theological language into philosophical language, but also just overall his synthesis of different academic dip disciplines, like you described, you know, um, in his mind, talking about mathematics and history and art and philosophy and theology, all of this is one big discussion about um, interconnected things. Um, yeah. And just finding inspiration there to, to address these um, really important issues of secularization and modernity and bringing um, other perspectives to bear on these conversations, mm -hmm. not just the narrow um, kind of story yeah. that we hear. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. And in this sense, it's very typically Russian in the sense of this uh, tradition of thought that uh, I've been talking about, because this is why it was actually called, you know, Seedins for all unity. One of the ideas was that knowledge is one, and it's only through the developments, mainly within Western philosophy, this is how the Russians saw it, you know, that knowledge was actually fragmented into different disciplines and different areas. And the main problem there was, of course, the opposition between faith and reason. And so, in a way, the Russian project was about bringing these fragments of knowledge, fragmented knowledge, back together. And of course, in this sense, you know, it's not about interdisciplinarity. It's about your religious duty of bringing knowledge together in its original unity. Because to go back to the, to the idea of crisis, in a way, if you ask people from this generation, what is the cause? of the crisis of modernity. I think probably one of the most common answers would have been exactly that, that knowledge which existed in unity was splintered into different parts and that religion was opposed to secularism, to reason and so on. And we had to bring all these artificially separated parts back together. Well, I just want to close there because that was so eloquently put. And it, I just really appreciate you taking time to have this conversation. I, I feel like I've learned so much just from reading your chapter and interacting with you over the past couple of years and especially talking today. So thank you very much, Plymouth, for coming. And well, have... thank you, Joshua. Thank you very much for making me part of this project. I really enjoyed very much reading the other essays in the book. You know, we have now the book at the, my institute in Vienna, and I read with great interest the other papers there. I think there's some really excellent work that I'm using in various things that I'm working on right now. So oh. thanks very much. You are most welcome.